<laughs> oh, hi everyone. Uh, welcome back to Fulda, day two, uh, and part one of the Canada-U.S. exchange. Um, so we discovered as we started uh, talking to everyone uh, who was coming to the convening that we had so many more things that we could learn from each other, and we had a sense from that circle we would not even kind of break the surface of what everybody here is up to. And so these two exchange sessions are so that we can really kind of learn more from each other about what our <clears throat> what our work is. And uh, I think that was helpful for yesterday because it let us kind of talk more theoretically and philosophically about where the work is going, and then to have this place to talk more specifically about what the work is that we're all working on. Yeah, definitely. And I would just say this continues one of the through lines of the goals of the convening, which was to exchange. We have this amazing opportunity to be here together, um, and we wanted to give folks space to really speak specifically to work that um, is top of mind and share with one another in that way. We are also live streaming this. So hello to anyone tuning in virtually. Again, we're still using the hashtag Folda. Um, <laughs> and um, we're so happy that you're here. Cool. I mean, the only thing I'll say is it's so weird for me. I'm really happy to sit down because this is the room that I teach in for most of the <laughs> And so it's great to sit down and learn from someone else in this room for a change. So. Welcome. Uh, first up is uh, Cynthia Ling Lee. Uh, she's a member of the post Natchem Collective, a grassroots and transnational web-based coalition of artists trained in South Asian dance whose work triangulates between art making, activism, and scholarship. Welcome. Thank Welcome, you. Cynthia. Also, Ramona is timing. We will keep these at hard 10 minutes, so please okay. help us support it's that. Okay. <coughs> Best player, please. dance for camera video that represents one of our like admin calls on Skype which was our technology of choice back in 2009 um, and you could see a, a number of different things from that video first of all just wanted to call the people into the room by name Shamala Murthy, Sandra Chatterjee, um, Shamala is based in Long Beach California Sandra is in Munich and in um, Salzburg and then is in India a lot of the time. Anjali, who's no longer with us, um, was in Kansas. So we're a transnational collective of artists. Um, and you could see us juggling life, children, different time zones, um, this sort of playful use of South Asian sort of kind of rhythmic and musical structures and sort of gestural vocabulary in this quote unquote contemporary framework. And then of course, what may be familiar, all these kind of glitches and failures of mm -hmm. attempted communication across distance. It's a clearly a very like grassroots DIY <coughs> aesthetic. Um, 
And so we came together to work together. Um, the collective was founded, I think, back in, we're 15 years old now. Um, and when I joined in 2008, we started trying to connect long distance using free to inexpensive internet technologies, largely as a result of lack of funding resources or the needs to kind of, in a very sort of feminist, women-centered way, like also center other priorities such as family. Um, and so we've been collaborating together for many, many years as a result. Also as a kind of a response to a lack of uh, like-minded artists in our own communities kind of coming from forms that were marginalized in the, in the particular kind of progressive ways that we're working with them. So I joined, I was impatient, I was like, let's collaborate. We have this blog, which is really old and on Blogspot, which I know is embarrassing. Um, but we have like an archive of 10 years of working together. It's a really simple um, process. This is an example, we, we were writing love letters to Maude Allen, who's a historical dan orientalist dance figure from Canada, um, and then she lived in the U.S. and worked in Europe um, from the early early 20th century. Um, so we, we rotate giving each other assignments, like kind of choreographic assignments, then we get a few weeks to respond, we upload our responses to the blog, along with questions, we give each other feedback as blog comments, and then we keep rotating in that manner. So it's this kind of non-hierarchical structure. We think of this sort of as our online studio. We have a um, a, a sort of open source policy within the collective where we're invited to borrow steel and translate each other's material. Um, so yeah, let's um, go to the next video. I will talk about it for a second before playing it. So this is from a more recent um, work, which is, let's scroll down. It's called, it has a really long name, Salak, San Lorenzo, or Two Rivers, Two Continents. So over the years, we just sometimes found it useful to give a bit of a thematic or conceptual focus to our long distance collaborations, out of which many different products would sometimes emerge um, in like kind of local pods and in different sort of forms from scholarly paper to art installation to live performance as was possible within the uh, limitations of our lives. So this is an example of a more recent work that came out of a process called Borders Resurfacing. We were thinking about migrations and borders and citizenship across our various contexts. So that included the kind of Syrian refugee crisis in Europe. It included um, the unfortunate eventual election of Trump, the sort of right wing of kind of emergence of right wing kind of violent nationalisms globally. Um, and we're thinking about that, that in connection to, to water and memories as well. So um, the Salak is a, a river in that is the actual border between Germany and Austria, which Sandra commutes across like weekly, and which, you know, it's EU, so it's supposed to be open borders, but around that time in 2015 and later, suddenly that border closed again, and there was this like, you know, masses of like refugees waiting, trying to get into Germany, so her experience was really shifted by that. Um, and then the San Lorenzo River in Santa Cruz, California, where I live, um, is a local river that was the site of the last Chinatown in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz, um, for those of you who don't know, fancies itself very progressive, but it was a center for organized anti-Chinese um, mm. racism, um, xenophobic racism in the mid 1800s to early 1900s. Um, and that river was a source of life, um, of play, of sustenance for that community. It also destroyed the last community through flooding it and then that land got gentrified. So you press play and then I might be at time. <laughs> I'm not a composer, but for some reason I designed the sound for both of these. <laughs> over a little. In both these cases, all the videos were created long distance in our different locales.
as you sleep in between toes. Today you are sandy, round, smooth river rocks, sun sunlit sky, oh, yellow flowering, and waters meandering. Spires, the bees crazy with heat and power, feet teasing, talking, fighting with each other. How close the other side of the border, how seemingly effortless to cross it, uncouth. Stones gathered in rings, black and vestiges of campfires lit by refugees, small fires of hope, rehoming, unbelonging. As a, as a super one sentence brief closing remark, I'll just say over the, the course of the 10 plus years I've been part of Post Natyam, we've been really trying to move from being kind of transnational to translocal to still being really deeply engaged in our local communities, um, which you know this piece I think shows in different ways and it's part of an installation that is site adaptive. So it's moved from that context in um, Salzburg to San Francisco, to um, India, um, Dehradun most recently, and it'll be in Bangladesh. So at, at each of those sites, we also work with local communities and with local issues around issues of borders, migration, and water. So this is this kind of like very rich tension between this transnational long distance collaboration and trying also to be very rooted in place. Ta-da! <laughs> Next up, we have Tali Hinkis, uh, who is one of the New York-based art duo Lovid, together with Kyle Lapidus. Lovid's work includes immersive ins installations, sculptural synthesizers, single-channel videos, textile participatory projects, mobile media cinema, works on paper, and multimedia performance. Lovid has exhibited, performed, and participated in many cultural and educational programs around the world, including, among many, at, at Real Artways, Concordia <coughs> University, Dijon Museum, Smack Mellon, the Jewish Museum, Agnes Etherington Art Center, Netherlands Media Art Institute, Issue Project Room, MoMA, River to River Festival, <coughs> The Kitchen, and more. Lovid has received support from organizations including New York Hall of Science, the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation, iBeam, Harvest Works, Wave Farm, Rhizome, Franklin Furnace, New York Foundation for the Arts, and New York State Arts, State Council of the Arts. Welcome to all. What a partly participation-based performance here. Presentation. Ooh. 
Hi, yes, improvised. What do I need? Oh, this is just your quicker. Oh, cool. Hi. Yeah. Okay. Hi. So I, I started, I'm going to talk about one piece specifically, but based on our conversations yesterday, I did want to contextualize a little bit the work that I do. I think we talked a little bit, or I just mentioned the idea that the work I do really is centered on technology. I know Michael started the day yesterday talking about how we live in a world where technology media impacts, you know, we, from the moment, probably while we're asleep, it's impacting us. And so um, we really work with that idea in mind. So the technology we use, we use it for the sake of technology. We really, I'm really embracing the idea that working with media art is media and technology and the way it affects our bodies, our minds is at the center of the work. It's not in the service of another context. It kind of creates its own context and it's aesthetic, conceptual and technical, really interwoven and all of them um, are approached in the same kind of rigor. Uh, and coherent ideas. So this is like um, one of our earliest pieces. It's called the VideoWare. This was in uh, 2001 that we created. So this is predates any mobile devices that we have in our body. There were no iPhones, i anything um, kind of video um, that we could take around. And what we did is we took uh, LCD screens and we mounted them on wearables. So it's this costume that have, we each have seven monitors on our body and they're all interconnected with uh, wires. One of the terms I think I have there is wireful, which is something we think a lot about. Wireless, it's basic communications we do not see. What we do is we reverse that and everything is tangible, wireful, physical. So we perform with this. And also in another context, we come from like a noise music background. So if you hear something, it's going to be loud. Yes. You might hate it. It's OK. It's not for everybody. This next? The one on the right. The one on the right. Uh, and I also wanted to give a shout out to my um, uh, art, you know, inspirations, again, to give it a context to where I come from. I know if a lot, hopefully some of you are familiar with the EAT Night Evenings kind of historical <coughs> event. Uh, they really brought together uh, for the f from what I know, for the first time, at least in technology, uh, artists, technologists working together, musicians, choreographers. Uh, and it was a historical thing that happened in New York City. And for me, this is kind of when I wanted to do art. That's, that's kind of that's what I want to do, you know. And um, really celebrating innovation, collaboration, process, uh, and um, you know, into this really interdisciplinary dialogue and coming from the perspective of at the time, you know, we had all these new technologies. How can artists use it? Now, not at the time, of course, not, you know, artists didn't were not programmers. So really, bringing people together to problem solve and come up with new ideas. They worked on a really tight timeline, which was really interesting. They didn't have a lot of time, but they had a lot of resources. Uh, another one is Stena Vasulka, who's an artist and also has always been involved in creating her own, um, with uh, her husband Woody, the Vasulkas, they've done a lot of really important uh, work in developing software and hardware. And Jody, which was like early net art, uh, you know, like really revolutionary in terms of glitch. And I'm gonna bring that out there because we talked about fragility yesterday. And so I really embrace fragility in technology as a way to connect with technology and the human body and remind us it's, you know, everything breaks. It's okay, we just have to take care of it. And so just a couple of quick things, again, the work that we do, the performance space that we do, they come from the music tradition. It's kind of AV, it's big, it's immersive, it's loud, it's noisy, it's flickery. <laughs> um, and so a couple of just like quick slides. On. And also the instrument we make, so the thing we wear, and this is Kyle, my husband, partner, uh, the instrument, this is an instrument that made out of cardboard and like paper mache and a lot of pa and, like collage. It makes sound and video. It's a handmade analog synthesizer. Yes. We, we attach them in weird ways so we're like, it's like hanging between us. It's uncomfortable to perform. It's like you have to be there looking in each other's eyes with like people watching you. That's, that's what this is. Uh, <laughs> A couple of other projects that kind of also related to things we're talking about. This is a big series we did called I Parade, which was mobile. Um, it's like a site-specific uh, cinema. So we, it, I actually researched different neighborhoods. I'm not gonna go in New York State mostly. Uh, did like, little clips, and then I le led people. I didn't. I had dancers leading people through the neighborhood. Uh, where all, all it did. It's not interactive in a way, but you had to be present in a physical environment. And when you were in the right place, a video would come up that's inspired by where you were. And so it's this immersive, a different way of thinking of immersive uh, media in public space and the human body in relation to video 10 years after we did the video wear. Here again, video in public spaces, <coughs> handheld 
connected to the body. Another quick reference, this I was thinking of it also because we were in these beautiful circles yesterday, and for me that was a really effective way to do it, and it also reminded me of a long project we did for three years, um, which was called uh, Reaction Bubble, and uh, it was based around the idea that we have these uh, uh, areas of interaction, we have like physical uh, public spaces, uh, personal space, intimate space, these kind of areas, like zones, and they really mapped out in the same way as that we had the inner circle, outer circle, so let me think of that. And I will show you a little clip quickly. Switch to that. Let's see, let's see. Uh, this one, and this, uh, and I will talk a little bit about it. And I don't need the sound, because actually, ooh, can I turn off the sound? the sound? No, I don't need the sound on that. Uh, this is like the sound was for the performance. So again, this was, so uh, I did get to do some work uh, in response to the, to the um, eight evening, uh, eight, nine evenings project. So this is something that's come out of it, and this was a Russian definition project that was a three-year research with a choreographer, Deborah Goff, and um, a ceramicist, Matthew Towers. And what we did is we really studied, and it took a really like three years to think what these, th these four circles of interaction mean in relation to, to performance space, exhibition space, and also just uh, technology. Where does technology fit in, and how do we play with these? So we w worked together. Uh, you know, meeting about once a month in person or digitally, and then at the end we have this uh, installation that includes the sculptural work. Uh, the bowls in the middle that they're kind of hovering about have sensors in them, so it's actually affecting. They're they're close to how close they are to these bowls affects the video that you see in the back. It has kind of video effects. We don't have to run, so we'll go quickly to my next section, which is going to be my final section. This section is interactive. It's interactive because. I couldn't log into my arena platform on that computer. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass this around. But I do want to talk. <laughs> you can play that at the same time. This is our current project. I've launched a project. It's going to take a million years to do. I have 10 people working with me on it. But I, I want to talk about it. And I can pass it around. So you can, this is, we're keeping kind of a, like a arena. So can you pass it around and scroll through it? Uh, the, 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 so this is a, a public workshop where right now at the residency of New York Hall of Science, um, we are working that with um, these uh, biosensors. We have a choreographer experimenting with what the sensors are doing on the video. The idea behind it is we started a, a working at um, UC Santa Barbara, um, looking at environmental issues around, and the way they're restoring, like. Um, this kind of landscapes around the campus, doing uh, research into sustainability and ecology. So all the footage that you'll see, and you'll see there in the photos, is filmed on site. And we're taking that and um, animating in this a part of a performance. Uh, let's see what else is happening here. You'll see, OK, I'll show you more. So you'll see some of our research stuff. And you see us working at the lab. We have two students, two um, high school students working with us. How many? Were, how am I doing? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Um, yeah, I have a lot to say about this project, but I think what I'm going to say is that really we're taking on this a lot of what we were talking yesterday about how do we make something interactive, interdisciplinary, and we're really taking the time to explore this. This is the first time that I have the ability to bring in a lot of different people. I have a costume maker. Weaver, you'll probably see some of the photos. I'm designing a new textile piece for this wearable jacket that will also interact with uh, some of the performance. And um, this is a, an experiment we did. We opened it to the public for like a couple of hours. We're doing another one this Saturday. And people were invited to come and just kind of interact with what it feels like to, um, <coughs> to wear this biosensor. Just like a quick thing, the biosensor basically, you'll see, it kind of flickers. Right now it's very simple. We're starting very simple. Uh, when they're moving, it does this kind of flickering thing, depending on what they're doing. And there's a kind of a red flicker that based on their heart rate. Mm -hmm. And so conceptually, the idea is uh, based on experiences that I have. I'm a very intuitive person when it comes to technology and nature. And so bringing those two intuitions together to one space, the experience of being in a natural, immersive experience especially one that's not manicured, that's very wild, that has a lot of mm. you know, unpredictable things. Uh, for me, it's a very, you know, obviously <coughs> it's a multi-sensual experience. 
And I experience uh, video in the same way, and media in the same way. So the idea behind this performance is to, to bring the audience to have that same relationship with the surrounding immersive uh, video and to make these connections between the natural world and the um, electronic world. This is Kyle playing an electronic synthesizer. Play it for one second, the sound. So you'll hear it's noisy. <laughs> I know, I'm out of time. Oh, we can hear a little bit of it. Yeah, that's great. So the, the sound is all analog. There'll be analog video too. I didn't get into that, but. <laughs> oh, then you had little kids doing YouTube videos. Like little YouTube dance, you know? Anyways, that's it. It's my time. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you for that. Uh, next up is Bridget McIntosh. Bridget is an award-winning arts and culture strategist. She has held senior cultural programming and policy roles at the City of Toronto, Mississauga, and Hamilton. She's the past vice president of Festival and Events Ontario and speaks on the Canadian Arts Coalition Research and Policy Committee and for the Project for Public Spaces Placemaking Leadership Council. Her work is focused on the role government plays in creating infrastructure for the arts and culture to flourish, as well as exploring ways to support and champion cultural expression in the public realm. You can find her online at, at Bridget Ann Mack. And I might also add, I've known Bridget for a very long time. She also used to be the producer of the Fringe Festival when I was an indie artist. So we've been negotiating performance for a while. She's also the most recent member of the Spiderweb Show Board. Thank you. Um, I don't have any visuals, and I just thought, you know, it was so great just having the opportunity to see the other artists present their work, and uh, I just wanted to give a shout out to Folda for bringing us all together to talk about this work. Um, so yes, I'm a policy wonk, and I do think that cultural policy is such a vital part of the artistic process, and my personal work ethos is all about how to make that accessible, how to encourage more performing artists to be aware of what is happening with their governments in terms of um, arts and culture policy, um, because it does guide so, so much of our work. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is just the Canadian Arts Coalition. Um, there is a research and policy committee that Michael mentioned that I sit on. The Canadian Arts Coalition, it is a nonpartisan um, organization um, guided by a volunteer steering committee made up of uh, arts organizations from across the country um, with artists and arts administrators sitting on <coughs> numerous various groups. Um, one of the groups that we're focusing on is, is digitally related. And what the coalition does, first and foremost, we advocate. We make sure that arts and culture funding is championed, that we are stressing its importance, we are making sure that it is incorporated in um, federal budgets, and we also advocate for strong cultural policy. We want to make sure that any culture, cultural policy that is developed is based on you know, meaningful con consultation with arts communities and that it is well informed by the actual practitioners who are working and, and living in that world. So I mentioned that um, digital, and also if I'm talking too fast or too loud, just give me a shout out, you're all good? Excellent. So with the digital, um, yeah, so there are many different federal like related digital strategies that are coming out. So there's the Creative Canada Framework, so that was put out by our current Liberal government and when these types of policies are put out, um, our job at the coalition is we review them, we analyze them, and we make sure that there is a response that is distributed out or that the governments are aware that, that we're reading it, um, we're providing comment on it, and we're making sure that artists across the country are aware of what's happening there. So that's one piece of uh, policy that, that we help enrich by ensuring good consultation, and we also respond back to governments to let them know what we think about it. There are also funding programs such as the Canada Council's Digital um, Strategy Fund. So this is a significant investment. Um, just may double check my notes. Uh, between 2017 and 2021, the Canadian government is going to be investing 88.5 million dollars into this fund. It is significant in terms of how digital will affect um, the Canadian performing arts and Canadian creative industries. So again, with the Canadian Arts Coalition, we have a very, very <laughs> vested interest in making sure that we're following how that fund is being developed, who is receiving the money, how is it being used, and just keeping an eye on um, how that is affecting the sector. 
So when I go back to the research and policy committee work that we're doing, I talked about digital being one of the aspects. Um, what we are planning on doing is releasing a series of white papers, just to, again, make sure that the community is informed of what is happening. Three of the main issues that have come up um, in terms of the role of digital and performance is one, just competition and distribution. So with the internet and um, just so many different digital forms, we want to make sure that artist rights are protected, that copyright um, is in place. When artists are creating using a digital, digital medium and that is, you know, interneted out or communicate, interneted out, I just love the word, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and communicated out. We do want to, I like that. I know, I like it. We're going to coin that, interneted, yes, TM. We want to make sure that um, artist rights are protected. I know CARFAC is a great organization as well that, um, that does work in that world to make sure that um, copyright is protected. We're also very curious about the role of digital in the actual art form itself. So, um, when you have anyone who can access the digital, check, the digital technology and create art, what does that mean for the actual craft? So if you have your traditional disciplines of dance, theater, visual art, a long history of people who have trained in a certain medium, when suddenly anyone can create art, what is the value of the actual craft? And just making sure that, well, what is that? What is art? What is Canadian culture? when everybody now through a digital medium has the ability to create in it. Um, and then what did I have here? Oh, and third, just in terms of the roles of, of digital, is digital more or less a, terms, a, a tool for innovation or is it a means of making the, the art more accessible to many different people? So there are just many different questions that we are looking at and investigating there. So with the Canadian Arts Coalition, I encourage you to check out their website, canadianartscoalition.com, they're on Twitter. Um, and especially with the federal election coming up this year here in Canada in October, um, very curious to see how that um, potential change in government could affect some recently announced um, arts funding that happened earlier this year. So that's another concern that we have here in the Canadian arts ecology is just sustainability in terms of funding. So uh, a funding program's announced, so many arts organizations plan out their season and figure out what projects they're going to do, but then suddenly when that project funding or that funding is cut off and priorities shift, how do you continue to create in a digital world when suddenly your funding isn't there but the technology continues to advance and how do you reconcile that? Um, so segueing, how am I for time? Am I okay? You're good. Am I all right? about four and a half minutes. Perfect. So quick segue, the other project that I'm working on um, is a group called Mass Culture. And I talked really briefly about how do we make sure that um, the arts community is keeping tabs on cultural policy, how can they get involved in making sure that, um, that, that their needs and, and their wants and uh, what have you are incorporated in, into cultural policy. So Mass Culture is a nonprofit organization that is aimed at identifying what gaps there are in Canadian arts and culture research. Um, just to, to make sure that we are reaching out, not just in the major city centers, but we are going deep into the like, rural communities as well. There's many different practitioners in rural and remote regions across Canada. And, you know, unfortunately in the past, sometimes their views aren't heard as loudly as urban city centers. We want to make sure that <coughs> what they need, what they um, want, are also incorporated into um, just what is needed on the arts and culture research front. Um, so we're going to identify what is missing and then we also want to make sure that we are communicating current artistic policy and research that does exist and making sure that it's communicated um, extensively out to the Canadian um, arts and culture community. So my role with Mass Culture is I'm their digital gathering coordinator and in the past um, Mass Culture has only been around for a couple of years since 20, late 2017. And they have been convening um, a series of in-person gatherings, and that is going to communities across the country to identify different issues affecting um, the arts community across Canada. And it was felt that we needed to be able to use digital to make those gatherings more accessible to communities across the country. So we piloted two digital gatherings earlier this year. The first one had to deal with municipal cultural planning and uh, just the evolution of that and what, what are the next steps because as we know most cities um, and towns across the country, both Canada and the US, have cultural plans to guide how municipal governments um, support culture in their communities and in most cases those policies are now just sitting on a shelf collecting dust and there are many cities who are looking for guidance in terms of 
what are the next steps? So that digital gathering um, was a chance to gather people together to discuss the topic, and it was fantastic for a pilot project. We had about 400 people from across Canada and the US join us in that initial gathering. It's all online, massculture.ca. You can check it out. And yeah, so now we're just using Zoom and trying to find a way to have those digital gatherings not so much be about you know, a talking head talking out, but looking at using breakout rooms, doing a lot of pre-planning to make sure that we are engaging our communities more effectively. So um, yeah, I guess um, <laughs> that's about it for now. I know it's not a lot of visuals, but <laughs> massculture.ca, they're online. Um, you can follow their work and yeah, but no, I'm really happy to be here, so thanks. <laughs> So next up, we have Future Perfect. Uh, Future Perfect is an interdisciplinary creative studio and research collective confronting the shifting <coughs> features of live performance. Wayne Ashley started the company in 2011, and Xander Saren joined in 2015 as the co-artistic director. Working across different histories and knowledge, they create unique projects for the web, park, street, theater, opera, festival, and more. Thank you. And Xander. <laughs> We have text to read, so um, we're kind of um, uh, reorchestrating the room here. Thank you. And also, can you put the volume up a little bit? Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm Wayne Ashley, and this is Xander Seren. Uh, we're from New York City, Brooklyn. So in 2009, Future Perfect's first project sent three people to the hospital. After experiencing convulsions, hallucinations, and temporary memory loss, and induced euphoria and panic in hundreds of others. The work was called Z by artist Kurt Henschlager. We built, we built Z in a huge room filled with fog. It was, the fog was so thick you could barely see your hand. And when the audience entered the room, powerful strobe lights began pulsing, which the artists controlled, manipulating their speed, intensity, and color with complex software and computer interface. Well, pulsing lights are one of those stimuli that causes the brain to become unstable. And this instability creates a curious effect. The architecture of the brain reveals itself to itself, projecting onto the retinas the most vivid, pulsing, hallucinatory mandalas. These are some of the things that people are experiencing inside the brain. These are the actual patterns that are happening. So for 20 minutes, with their eyes open, Spectators lost a sensation of having a physical body while existing in pure abstract psychedelia. The entire work took place in the brain and was impossible to document. We call this a dramaturgy of the brain. The only way you can access the work is through verbal testimony. And so we have some uh, interviews of people that just came out of the experience. I don't know. I don't know how I'm worried. It. Um, it's really hard to say something smart about something that's so like purely sensual. It's just light. And then all, I, the, all the images are what you like create. Yeah. Um, that was the most insane thing I've ever. They're part of. At first, it was extremely uncomfortable. I really wanted out. The anxiety was almost scary. He opens the first door and it's like, boom. Once your visibility starts going, you're kind of like, okay, well, what's, what's happening? You don't even know where you are. You lose your sense of space, time, and motion. I mean, I didn't even know I was in there for 20 minutes. I would have guessed like two minutes. It did feel a little bit like that. You know, like, if you don't have a body, is this what? Your existence is like. If you went to heaven, like it felt like you would be like entering heaven. I've never, I've never felt like that ever. That like happens so purely in your own brain that that it's impossible to even compare it to anybody else's. 
forms are appearing in front of you. Fractals and, and B-Ways that just moved around. So Z represents something we've been struggling with for a long time. How do we structure and design collaborations across disciplines that enable different metaphors and perceptual experiences? To create Z required an epilepsy doctor, an industrial fog specialist, a brain researcher, and an exhibition designer. Um, I'll share a little bit about what Future Perfect is. As we were introduced, where we define ourselves as an interdisciplinary creative studio and research collective. You might ask, what, what is that? Um, <laughs> we situate ourselves somewhere in between an architecture firm, a think tank, a research lab, and a design studio, but for performance. Um, and we're not connected to an institution or university, we're an independent company. Uh, we work with clients to build and implement, design, build, and implement artistic and commercial projects. We originate new work, and we consult with governments and institutions. We are a company that values, and we've been thinking through a lot about this, what are our core values, and, and being here with all of you has been really helpful to kind of think through that, <coughs> situate that. Our core values are hybridity, failure, play, uncertainty, process, vulnerability, and time to think deep and critically, and raising money to support those values. <laughs> so here's another project I want to talk to you about um, that we commissioned um, that further exemplifies the way we work. Um, this is a piece called Shuffle. It's a performance installation that premiered in New York uh, at the New York Public Library in 2011. We brought together the theater company Elevator Repair Service, which some of you may know, a statistician and a professor, Mark Hansen, and media artist, Ben Rubin. We asked them to consider the question, what might a theater piece look like and feel like that was completely structured and orchestrated by a computer database? <laughs> Working together with Hansen and Rubin, we built a software system for analyzing the novels of Hemingway, Faulkner, and Fitzgerald. Complex algorithms combined words and sentences from each of the three novels to generate new dramatic texts on the fly every 20 minutes. These texts were sent wirelessly to touch pads that were embedded in books, which artists read and improvised in front of a constant shifting audience. With Shuffle, I think we, and we've been, we talked about data, this is one of our ways of working with um, data and figuring out how it could relate to the body. Because data has been visualized, it's been analyzed, but we really wanted to talk about the embodiment of data, and this was one of our ways of exploring how um, uh, performance and data analytics might inform one another. It's a compelling hybrid that opened up new thinking about text, narrative and mise-en-scene, and the role of libraries as generators of culture, creating playful dialogues between machines and humans. And more recently, in 2017, we were hired uh, to serve as the creative producer for Aquasonic, uh, an underwater music concert by the Danish ensemble Between Music. Uh, the company had been working on the project for at least six years, running up against a number of obstacles they couldn't solve. Um, and the group discovered that creating melody and sound underwater was obviously incredibly complicated. Uh, for example, when the instruments were submerged underwater, the tuning changed from one moment to another and was difficult to stabilize. One moment they made sound, another moment they were completely soundless. The instruments started to deteriorate and rust as soon as they were put in the water. Um, and amplifying Sound from underwater obviously has many electrical risks. <laughs> and so, <laughs> to begin to solve these problems, we brought in a number of specialists. Uh, the first of which was an aquatic acoustic engineer who was dealing with sound pollution affecting the world's oceans. He helped us to understand the acoustics of water and how sound behaves in confined glass tanks. Um, and, and help us solve various problems related to bubbles, temperature, algae, chemicals in the water, skin particles, all of which affect the sound and volume and tone. Um, and we discovered that every time we performed, uh, we had to create a whole ecosystem. Um, and we also brought in Future Perfect team member Andy Capitorta, an engineer and artist who had previously worked with Bjork to develop instruments for biophilia. Mm -hmm. 
um, and an engineer, electronic engineer turned cymbal smith, whose sole job was to tune the instruments because underwater their tone would shift, becoming flat in, from one moment to another. Um, and then finally we brought it to an anthropologist um, who helped us understand the historical and cultural implications of producing music underwater. Uh, there's a long preoccupation around sound and water that goes back to Handel, Berlioz, Ravel, John Cage, others. Um, and we finally premiered the work at Operdagen Festival of New Music and Theater in Rotterdam, and the work went on to tour worldwide. And we'll just show you a short clip of Aquasonic. Thank you. <laughs> because it really does create a whole ecosystem. Thank you very much. Project the World Theater Map. Let me set my timer. <laughs> Here, I can time. I can. That's okay, I got it. Um, awesome. So, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Ramona Ostrowski. I'm the producer of HowlRound Theater Commons. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization based in the U.S. Um, and as some of you know, we partnered with Spiderweb Show to produce the digital and performance convening yesterday. Um, and now we're around for the rest of Folda. Um, seeing shows and live streaming some sessions. So HowlRound is a free and open platform for theater makers worldwide. Uh, we amplify progressive, disruptive ideas about the art form and connect diverse practitioners. Um, on average, about 50,000 theater makers uh, participate in our platform per month. Um, some of our tools include an online journal where theater makers share ideas and opinions, a live streaming television channel uh, that any theater organization can use for free. Um, but as Jamie said today, we're here to talk about our newest project, the World Theater Map. Um, so what is the World Theater Map? Uh, it's a user-generated directory and a real-time map of the global theater community. It features information about theater uh, productions, all types of theater practitioners, and organizations. So similar to Wikipedia, anybody can add information and edit the map. And right now, the map is in English, French, and Spanish, and it features over 10,000 practitioners, 5,000 organizations, 7,000 shows, and 3, uh, 300 festivals around the world. Um, but what does it do? Really the purpose of the map is to connect the global theater community in order to facilitate conversation, knowledge sharing, and ideally movement building. It's an ever-growing map of the global theater infrastructure, the art we make, and the people in our community. So on the homepage, you can see all the events in the directory that are happening on that day. Uh, I'll, I'll pull up the map live later, but this is basically a map that rotates and sort of highlights the different shows that are happening on that day. Um, but you can also search our directory in many different ways. Um, so you can use it to find directors or designers or scholars in a specific country or specific city. Um, you can discover people, shows, festivals, and organizations by their area of interest. So for example, you could search for artists and organizations interested in puppetry, climate change, or <coughs> indigenous work. Um, you can also find shows by women or directors who are interested in theater by and for women. Um, the possibilities are endless, and the more the theater community participates in this collaborative process, the more useful it becomes, right? The map is only as good as the information that people put into it. 
So we believe that the world theater map can reveal and connect our global theater community in a new way um, for this digital age. And we're really eager to hear, uh, to use really the bulk of our time today um, to hear questions that you guys might have about the map, um, ways you think it could be useful to you, both in its current iteration and in potential future iterations, um, and any ideas about how we can activate it um, in order to make it a truly useful tool uh, for folks around the world. Um, so as Jamie said, um, obviously she's here, I'm here, uh, a couple of our other colleagues are here, but in particular um, our colleague Vijay is here who has been sort of the point person on our team who worked closely with the developers um, and continues to engage uh, with the community who are, are deeply using the map. Um, so we'd love to open it up. Uh, yeah. I asked a question um, earlier, which I didn't get an answer to. So we were all asked as convening participants to put our information yes. in. Yes. And I couldn't figure out how to do that since we're located in multiple places around the world. Yeah. So yeah. I was wondering if there was an answer to that. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so at the moment, it's uh, one to appear as an actual pin in your organization. Mm -hmm. um, it can, one location is, is necessary. Right. Yeah, so it's not able to okay. have, have multiple uh, <clears throat> pins. Yeah, I would probably not enter my information then because it would yeah. contribute to hierarchies in our collective. So, cool, good to know. Yeah, that's really interesting though because you could, like, could potentially you do multiple put entries for the same organization. Like, you know what I mean? Like, right, post not even four times. You could. Times. Yes. You can. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you could, like, if you had a particular, is all your, are all your pieces created digitally, or are there, ever, like, you could create a, <coughs> for an event, a performance that for an event. in a specific place, but if, I guess if the organization, right. like, the collective wanted to just, like, be on the map, yeah. then I, I'd have to pin it in at least three places. Totally. Yeah. The other thing, just to say, that, I mean, this would be a little bit of a workaround, it's not yeah, a total yeah, fix, yeah. but there is a function to set up like an association network like partnership. Yeah. So like oh. each of the individuals could have profiles that were then okay. linked under the banner of post but it, okay. it would be a little, it wouldn't kind be exactly what you're asking for, yeah. but it would still. So either I like enter it in three times or I do a, like a, yeah. a network. Uh, this isn't particularly helpful, members. but just uh. to say, it, it really makes me think of the idea yesterday of carbon-based reality, yeah. and like that this is about where your carbon base is, but, but the performances are not carbon-based, and this is a picture of our big ball of carbon. Yeah, and people working yeah, across <laughs> distance is becoming quite common, though, yeah. too, so it's just... For yeah. sure. No, I think that's definitely a, a potential feature. I built one of them, yeah. too. Cool. Uh, regarding shows, does it become like an archive of shows that have already happened? Yeah. And is it only like running current, like if I sign up for it or register my information, can it become a holding space of like every show I've ever done in the past? Yeah, yeah, so the archive, so this is the current homepage only shows uh, like current and future, yeah. but if you go to an organization site, you'll get a whole archive, yeah. So an artist could technically like put their whole like CV of performance work yeah. so far back make that part of the, this database. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. In, like, in our dreamy vision, Utopia, it was like, this could be like a living CV. Because uh -huh. mm -hmm. like, you can literally link out, you could link out to, um, you know, the framework is there to be able to link out to whatever other kinds of media or things you would want to share about a piece. Yeah. Um, and so that's very much part of what some of the original thinking was and yeah. how it could be used. Yeah, one thing that came up like a couple of times in early conversations <coughs> I remember is like, Theater people don't really use LinkedIn, <laughs> right? Like, like, like what LinkedIn might be for other organizations or for other industries. Like, this is potentially one use you of this. Do you have a sense of how much it's being used in terms of like not just people posting, which is really obvious, but like people searching for artists, collaborators, events? Like this? Yeah. Yeah, but actual. Um, well, we were able to track how much. Uh, how much of how many organizations and uh, artists and shows are in there? Right. Uh, but then the actual like Who's did, looking, did yeah. a connection happen? Happen? Yeah, that's harder for us to capture. Interesting. Yeah, I mean we can get Google Analytics of like how many people are on the site right. at a time, but 
yeah, not being necessarily being attracted to the engagement of like if I find Kate like through this site, we connected through the site that. Yeah, not her. not well. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's a dream, though. Yeah. Like, I mean, I think one thing yeah. that we've been spending a lot of time talking about what would incentivize people to uh, activate this tool more, mm -hmm. and I think if it could have like a real time um, sort of illustration of the kinds of connections that are being made, mm -hmm. right? That could be one way that would really uh, bring people perhaps yeah. more into it. Um, so that's an interesting notion. Yeah think about how we would move in that direction. I had a comment here, and then we'll go to Sage. Uh, it's a functionality question. It's about when registering a, any, like a show or an organization, does it require that the person registering it is part of that show or that organization? Oh, yeah, no. It's because, exactly. okay, so it is as open as Wikipedia. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is smart in terms of, like, if you have someone who's really keen, in, like in Toronto, we actually have um, a guy who's doing this in, basically at the most minute level by himself. Um, and it's called the Toronto Theatre Database. Um, and he's just like entering everything that has ever happened. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's amazing. I think it's like, it's amazing. Uh, it's, like what he's doing is amazing. It's also like totally unsustainable. But, but I, like if you have a key person like that in the community who at least could just like enter all of the basic organizations, yeah. mm -hmm. I think about like when I travel, I try to see theater wherever I am. Mm -hmm. It's incredibly difficult to do that, particularly yeah. when language is a barrier, but even more so than language being a barrier is like marketing budgets being a barrier mm -hmm. and right. sort of who has bought Google AdWords and who has not. You know, like it's, it's a bit hard to kind of uh, navigate. And so I see this as a really exciting tool for that, but particularly if sort of per community like I'll just go home and put all the Toronto theaters, and then you can know where they are. But they can yeah. figure it out to write in what shows they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. That's we cool. did. Um, we have experimented with a program called World Theater Map Ambassadors, where we've basically um, had people exactly like that, like in specific communities, apply. Uh, not even apply. Basically, just opt in to be like the ambassador for their community and do work, both inputting it uh, into the map and then like sharing the map. Yeah. Out, um, yeah, and we're definitely interested in continuing that. So. Well, it, it democratizes the idea of like uh, what makes something a legitimate theater. Yeah, right? like, absolutely. There isn't a, a necessary sort of platform or place for it. Yeah. Um, other than this, which is very good. Totally. Well, that was our time, but we'll go to Sage and then. I was curious about and since you can say about organization show. That all those are there tags? Like, if I want to find work around ab abolition, or yeah. you know. Just um, yeah, so if you go to the search, um, you can basically, the, uh, this interest tag, um, we have only a certain number of Yeah, there are about 40, now, 40 but interest tags, and, um, and, uh, and this was a list that was uh, co-created over many, many years of a, of a previous project, and then other, and many organizations got involved in creating this kind of taxonomy. And that's really the, the core of how um, people can find um, particular artists or organizations or festivals that have a particular interest and, um, and to be able to connect these communities that may not even know each other. Yeah. Um, so I think if you just click just underneath there, it'll have loaded now. Oh, yeah. So there you'll see um, these, these tags. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think we're very open to adding these interest yeah. tags. Um, Michael and I were just chatting. It's 11.03, mm -hmm. um, and we have only a handful of people. We have two folks left on the docket for today. So um, I'd love to ask this group for your support if we could maybe spend a little bit more time mm -hmm. on this. It's just sure. so valuable for us to have feedback from folks um, from all over. I would really, uh, yeah. So OK, so we're going to spend maybe 10 more minutes then. Um, thank you. appreciate that. I have a question, I guess, comment at this point you're talking about. If you know of any, like, um, or, you know, if we could have, uh, like, a vision for some support for a platform like this, you know, as, like, an app, like a mobile, like, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. art-related, you know, like a, like a real funding to make something that is social media, that is mapping, and has all these facilities that, you know, whatever, Google, but it's really for art and culture that is kind of like like a function from the non-for-profit art 
community to serve yeah. that, but to get real, uh, you know, government, you know, talk about legislators support to yeah. get that kind of. Because I mean, because I'm thinking sometimes like you, you want it on you want it mobile, you yeah. want it on mobile, but I know like to you know app design is like has costs and you know hassles that are different. And yeah. <coughs> The other thing I want to just offer about the impact of the interests, which we haven't touched on yet, is that they, these interests also align with um, taxonomy terms, like topic terms, on the HowlRound website. So there's a connection between the map and the HowlRound website. So anyone who has an account on HowlRound that's single sign-on also has an account in the map. And there's a way in which what we're trying to do is have these, these different um, sites kind of move folks back and forth, right? So if you're interested in, if you search for um, uh, a topic on Mara, you'll also see <coughs> related, basically, uh, anything from the map that has been tagged with that interest. So individuals, organizations, shows, um, which is kind of our first attempt at bringing together, well not first, but one of many attempts we've had at bringing together these things that sometimes have felt uh, disparate, we're trying to bring them under kind of one, one banner and let the energy that might exist in one inform the energy of the other. Yeah. I just have two, I just have, I have two thoughts. One is more of a question. In terms of the intersectional uh, interests um, that in the HowlRound articles you can have, you know, it's like opera, new work, music theater could all be part of one article. Yeah. Is it possible to search like multiple interests together intersect, intersecting or is yeah. it one yeah, of these? Like okay, great. And then second, I just wonder in terms of reinventing the wheel and things like that, how there might be a, a larger call or organizations or government organizations might be able to help um, connect you to people like this guy in Toronto who are yeah. doing similar work uh, already. Yeah. Because I also know there's a California yeah. database, and yeah. and, and I wonder. Wiki, right? Did we talk about? Yeah, yeah, and I just think I, I think I wonder how maybe <laughs> Jay there are other there are other people or oh I wonder what the call is or where the call is yeah. for people to come and say we would like to participate and the network could broaden so that this could be a tool totally. that intersects a number of different endeavors. Totally. And I think one cool thing like that we've actually envisioned is that it can go the other way too, right? Like do you want to talk about how people can like take the data and yeah. do so stuff they want all, with already it? At the, at the moment we've um, we've published all of the data <coughs> publicly um, as an API. So any other um, organization that is able to engage web developers can take all of this data, mm. it's a huge amount, um, and, uh, and be able to totally redesign, re-sculpt mm. this data into something that can be um, for a particular um, application. So for example, if, um, if uh, I don't know, uh, Toronto wanted just to know about their particular shows, they can make a, a mobile app mm. pulling from this data, mm. um, and yeah, and, and it's a yeah real time being able to um, pull that in. And we have an example of using this publicly available API on HowlRound.com, where um, if you go to our tags page, um, several of the tags, like for example, uh, Roma Theater, um, it's if you go to that tag page, you'll see uh, pulled into HowlRound.com are the like artist profiles and the organizations mm -hmm. that uh, that are related to that particular tag well mm -hmm. yeah so that's just to say like that's yeah, I think connecting with the people who are already doing it is a great idea and could potentially like work both ways, yeah. right like that guy in Toronto can like make this more robust. David Fisher. David Fisher, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. That's great. But right, and then also if he wanted to then like that take guy. it back out mm -hmm. and have and have it embedded in his own website, like as whatever. Oh. Yeah. And then only one oh, yeah. can I just one last question would be what would be a dream scenario? where you would see someone interacting with this successfully in your mind, or like your ideal of someone interacting with this? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what we're like dreaming a lot about right now, right? Is like, what is the ideal? I mean, I think some of it for sure is like, um, for me is like the, you know, the person to person connection, someone who maybe is in a place where they feel kind of isolated, being like the only dramaturg who cares about climate change <laughs> in, <laughs> 
Montana or like some, I don't know, you know, can, can find somebody somewhere else and like have a deep conversation or uh, maybe they start to collaborate. Um, but do you want to talk a little bit about like the sort of community yeah, wide I vision? Think, I mean, the, the thing about this, this project is in a way it's a, it's a conversation starter in terms of helping to reveal what are the particular uh, needs out there that a peer produced data set of database can help address. And we know that for Howard, one of our concerns is to break isolation of theater makers and organizations around the world. Um, and so one use that we particularly, uh, for Howrah, have found valuable is that, for example, um, in Malawi, um, the theater community there has been using this to really um, find out who, who everyone is throughout the country, all the artists. And, um, and they've been creating offline, in real life meetings. Um, with the help of the map, helping to identify each other. And, um, and then doing other kinds of activities like, um, like uh, kind of a book club or article club for how run articles. And then they've started to write um, articles. And real kind of it's been used as a community development tool mm -hmm. in an amazing way. That's amazing. Um, and then there are other, other needs that we've seen revealed, like for example, um, someone who wants to find out locally what's happening now, right? Um, so it feels like it's, it's difficult to try to meet every <coughs> single need in one massive project. Um, and so in a way, this idea of a conversation starter is also like, what do we do when we uh, create, try to create this data ecosystem where if we have this massive data set and then we allow it to be freely accessible for other people to re-sculpt that, and then maybe those people can re-contribute to this project, and we can, um, you know, have multiple nodes of development. Um, but I mean, that's that's a kind of utopian dream. But yeah, so it's it, we're kind of in a phase of discovering, uh, uh, thinking that maybe what we need to do is refocus and address one specific need, and that is going to let other needs fall by the wayside. Uh, so that's, I think, where we are at the moment. Yeah. Um, but we do find a lot of promise in this idea of being an open, peer-produced platform, mm -hmm. revealing and allowing anybody to become visible to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to, to tag on to that, I want to say that part of, part of what this map is doing is, and someone uh, uh, talked about it earlier, is really, um, it's almost like a remapping, right? I mean, because, mm -hmm. because there's a sort of democratization of, any theater is a theater, any theater that's on this map is a theater, right? It's also a way to kind of revision, remap what is our infrastructure, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and also address the question of like who decides yeah. what yeah. the infrastructure is. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we had some folks also use it as a kind of um, uh, a tool for provocation around, say, putting in, um, you know, all of the female directors who have done work in the last year, right? Like in their particular community. And then using that to kind of have a conversation around like, look, the, like we exist as female directors, we're being underrepresented in the whole, but we are here and you can't ignore the fact that, that we're trying to move things forward, right? Um, I think also in the, in the utopian version, and I know that word is complicated based on our conversation yesterday, but I think, I do think this notion of people and organizations being able to find other people and organizations who have aligned values and interests mm -hmm. is a huge potential application of the map, especially across borders, right? Because like, I'll speak for myself, in the US, I might have a sense of, at least to some extent, the kind of people or orgs that I feel like are quite aligned with, with work that we might be doing. But for me, when you take me outside of the US context, it's a very different story, right? And so I think, I think there's a world in which that could also be, um, a, a dream would be that people could really find each other to organize across borders mm -hmm. through a tool like this, right? Mm -hmm. That it could help create some of, help, help offer some, some of the information needed to create some of those connections. Yes. So we'll go, uh, to yes. Have your hand and then. Yeah, oh, I just wanted to point out uh, <coughs> um, the theater wiki, which is a, uh, something that uh, Spiderweb show organized in 
Canada. It's a nationwide project dedicated to, it's a community maintained Canadian online encyclopedia of the performing arts. So it's interesting to just think about how, yeah, as you mentioned, different kind of countries or different kind of groups of people are doing this kind of thing and how we can kind of bring that all together. Yeah. This being in a global context, because it's very similar in fact, you know, and it's, it's community generated and it's been really useful Now that you her. brought it up, I have to say Great. two things. Yeah. So I just wanted to bring it up <laughs> to give Michael so the permission because he knows the most. But, it, but, you know, it's really amazing. Of course, people are thinking about where, where the need is and how we want to define, like, what this community is. And, and, of course, then all of these things are happening in different places at the same, same time, which yeah. actually brings us back to thinking about this, this map. How can we kind of connect all of our initiatives? How can we be, like, Instead of doing them, them those things all disparate in our own kind of communities or countries, how can we kind of bring our forces together and contribute to one bigger thing? So this is really exciting, I think. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I can be honest. We've stopped putting resources into uh, what's called performancewiki.ca now. Okay, sorry. Um, <laughs> I looked. Uh, and for a couple of reasons, and I'm going to be totally honest. One of them was we looked at this and we're like, no, this is better, <laughs> and I don't yeah. really want to fight it. Right. Like, sure. let's find a way to contribute to it since right. we're collaborating with HowlRound all the uh -huh. time. Um, but but two things to bring up that might be of interest. It was called Theater Wiki originally, and then um, Sarah Stanley was at a gathering of uh, indigenous cultural leaders from across the mm -hmm. country and presented it. And they're like, mm, we don't really make theater, and we don't want to put ourselves on the map. Uh, and so we had to buy a new URL and had to rethink about it. And we have some check boxes for the type of um, artists you are. So there's a check box for here first for indigenous artists to identify as such also uh, on the map. And so that was just something we ran into really early with yeah. that. Um, and then I have to just say, like, you know, we, I talked a little bit about this yesterday, but we made this transition from being an organization that just puts stuff online to also creating work and presenting work like this. And we just found that the resources that we would need to put into it to keep all this stuff up to date was really massive. Mm -hmm. I, in this very classroom, I gave an assignment to these students to each make five wiki entries. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, students do things of varying quality and they're doing some of high profile artists and I'm getting messages from those artists being like, there's this really crappy wiki article out there <laughs> about my career. And so, uh, so then, you know, you gotta fix that. You gotta yeah. fix that. And that's a lot of human resources and human resources are money. And so that, that's why that's really not moving forwards now. And so I am really interested in how we can just leverage your platform. That, that does go back, though, to the point uh, or made earlier about who <coughs> contributes what right. and do you have to be uh, part of the organization to contribute to it or, yeah. or not, right? Yeah, so right now anybody can edit or add, but we have a, what, like a report feature. Yeah, so if, um, for example, if someone um, enters in something that you are particularly interested in or, for example, you are that organization or that artist, um, you could subscribe to any changes and know um, and get an email notification that um, the particular page that you're interested in was changed. And then you can um, request a delete if you don't like it. Um, so there is, you can in a way claim an ownership in a way, or it's a way of, of the community being able to self-police yeah. if necessary. Um, yeah, and I think maybe, I mean, an important kind of aspect of the model of this, which I think for us as Howard is the most important thing is that it, it's a different narrative about ownership over information. It's a different narrative about who can become visible or who can be in the same space as other people. So that model of peer production and uh, collectively creating a database is, I think, a model or a concept that we're always interested in trying to figure out and experiment with. And it's very much in play in all of our other tools. Right, like the live streaming platform is shared infrastructure, the journal is community sourced and peer produced. So we're of a piece in using this model and how we work. Maybe with that. Yeah, I think we'll wrap up. Um, but thank you guys so much. Uh, we're going to be around, like I said, until Sunday morning. Um, we've got some postcards here, so feel free to take one if you're curious or a stack if you have a place to put them where other people will take them. Uh, thank you guys so much. Uh, okay, next up is uh, Lisa Marie Deliberto. She is the uh, artistic director of Theatre Direct. She's the founder of Fixed Point and Tale of a Town. 
Uh, she's doing her graduate studies in theater performance at York University, and she's faculty at Centennial College, uh, where she teaches clown. And just to say a brief story about Lisa Marie, she also led our wrap-up session to fold uh, last year, and we were so burnt out on the end of day four, <laughs> and nobody wanted to come to the wrap-up session. I had like really peer pressure everybody in this room, and then Lisa did the most amazing clown routine, like rolling around with the microphone, that like actually activated the room in this way I've never seen before, and so. Clown is more important than you think. Welcome, Lisa Marie. Oh, she's a mom. Yeah, there you go. Thanks, Michael. It's so amazing to, uh, to be here. I'm learning so much. Maybe we can put that on a little bit later. It's a bit of a joke, but sure. not really. <laughs> um, yeah, it's so amazing to be here because I am um, I'm actually really come from a, a clown and performance background and really, you know, my heart lies in the actual just pure theater comedy connection with people. And I'm really trying to kind of branch out and figure out different ways that we can bring that kind of comedy and timing and performance and play into theater. And in particular, um, uh, in particular, because, well, I'll just quote a couple things I heard yesterday. I heard someone say, we had a dream the internet would evaporate walls between people. I thought, whoa, like, hmm. And the internet would open up access and take away boundaries. Those are, and you know, and, and in terms of that, that utopia and talking about utopia and, and, and it, when the belief that theater and performance can create some kind of social change or create some kind of, uh, can, can, can bring people together so that we can start to think about things or look at things in a, in a different way or, or to, to, you know, remind ourselves that we're human together. And so then you think about like digital technologies coming on top of that. And I'm in particular, I'm particularly thinking about, thinking about it because I just recently took over a Theatre for Young Audiences company, Theatre Direct. And so now, you know, I have this, this hat on and these big shoes to, <laughs> big clown shoes, <laughs> to try and figure out how, how can we, um, how can we use digital technology with, with young people? Um, I'll just say that I came from a, a background where I worked with uh, my husband, Charles Ketchabaugh, right here, and we did a project called The Tale of a Town. It was a transmedia storytelling project, and we toured across the entire country um, over three years, gathering over 3,000 stories in 200 communities uh, through interviews and creating performance pieces in collaboration with local professional artists in every province and territory, up to the north, to the east, to the west. It was a, an amazing project. <laughs> and it ended up that we created a story, an online story map. Um, we created a, we're in the second season of a animated short TV series uh, on TVO called Main Street Ontario. And, but Charles was the digital media side of that. So as I move into leading this company and Charles is continuing with the Tale of a Town Canada um, and, and Fixed Point, I'm starting to think about, I, I'm, I'm on my own here in this, in this digital side. So if I was presenting for the tale of a town, I would have like, I have the story map, I've got like a really amazing presentation with videos and the story map and all of these things, but I'm so brand new in, in TYA. So I don't have any work yet <laughs> to show you. Um, but I do have a lot of questions and ideas and, and I really would like to, all this work is really inspiring, thinking of ways that we could collaborate together. And that's kind of why I'm here to think, to look through and look at all these different things that we could bring in. Um, I'll, I'll, I want to talk a little bit about a workshop, some things that have inspired me and some questions that I'm thinking of in terms of bringing in digital technology into theater for young audiences. I did a workshop with Alex Balmer, who's, who's here, you saw in the circle yesterday, um, called Blind Imaginings. And, um, you know, Alex was talking a lot about how can we decenter sight in performance? And then I thought a lot about theater for young audiences and then also digital technologies. Like how can we create more access 
to young audiences by using digital technologies through sound, through immersi immersivity, through interaction? How can we get them to become more involved? Can technology be the platform for us to share more and to create more accessibility? And that's a big question that I have. Like, can actually technology be that? But then I think, who has access? So that's another thing I think of. In, in Canada, we actually won't have uh, internet everywhere until 2030. So you think, oh my gosh, we'll live stream. That's how we'll reach these remote communities. This is how we'll reach these small schools, those places where we can't, <coughs> where we can't like tour and bring that. But we can't actually, and so we think, oh, we'll live stream it. Because it's so, but how can we live stream it? Because those communities, many of those communities don't have a internet. We think, oh, we're gonna use like, get people to tweet and use their phone and, and like, and work together. But in many of the communities, just like, just around here, in, if you think of like rural Saskatchewan or rural Manitoba, I don't know what the comparable thing is in the States, but everybody doesn't have a smartphone, you know? And so that's something like, I'm always thinking about. So you think about, you're trying to create more ac access you're trying to create more community through these digital technologies, but who's, who are you leaving behind in that, in terms of, and who is at the table, who, like, and, and how can we, so that's, these are just some questions that I'm just putting out there. I don't have the answers. Um, if, for example, just uh, we were gonna do a piece with um, Common Boots and Nightwood, those are two Canadian companies, with Theatre Direct called The Election right before the Canadian election. And it's an amazing piece that looks at the 2015 election uh, through like verbatim text and uh, people that went and volunteered through writings. And we want to live stream that to high schools across Canada, you know, right before the election. But again, it's a who, what high schools can do that, will do that, can pay for that, like that. So there's something to think about um, there. And I also think when I, when I saw that amazing, super inspiring piece, I mean, like you think about the things that we're seeing and how, where young people are in, in those things. That's where I'm thinking. And, and then I also think also about the effects of digital technology on young people and their brains. So I think about um, my son going to see Batman or whatever, Spider-Verse, and like asking me every day, like, are the doors shut? Are they locked? Is the, are there bats in here? Be, you know, what does it do to their brains? And like, well, how can we just, how much do we know about that? as we experiment. So that's another question that I have. Um, so I went to this gathering. Uh, I just got back, which is why you'll see my scratch paper in, in one second. But I just, got, I just got back from this place. Um, it was Digital Challenges for Young People in Theatre, a national conference. It was in North Vancouver. And where there were theatre theater artistic directors and uh, general managers from across the country but a small group, like it was a, on purpose, a small group of us at Presentation House led by Kim, Sel <coughs> Kim Selady, an amazing facilitator and thinker. He runs Presentation House. And we were asking each, it, each other um, the questions, the pr provocations were sharing best practices and innovations between our organizations, using new technologies and platforms to better connect with our audiences, and how we're adapting or not to our audiences, which is young people in this case as they are impacted by the new reality of the digital revolution. So it was interesting because there was a lot of talk about the or not, you know, like what, like maybe not. There was also then all this talk about, oh, well, you know, we could, we could have them tweeting during the show or we could add, just like these kind of, and they were all add on things. And again, would kids have their, like who has access to that? There was some interesting talks about creating, um, uh, digital conversations through like talkbacks, like how can one school talk to another school or one community respond to a question and then see in the next community what that school responded to and how can we kind of create these conversations, creating more empathy, you know, which is like, I think a thing that digital technology can do, especially for young people, it can kind of open their minds to understand that there's more than just them there, that people are living in a different way over there, that there's people over there that think this, and I think that. Does, I, I hope that makes sense. Um, but they were talking a lot about like to, a touring app, Master Tour, making one for Canada, which makes me think about the World Theatre Map and 
that kind like that like for practitioners those kinds of nitty-gritty things that you want to know when you're touring um, so I'm just reporting on this a little bit and um, yeah and having these kind of digital conversations however I think you know, it's really important, and we, we talked about this, that we all, all of us, there were old people. Like, there was no young people there. And really, there's no young people here. So that's just, I'm just putting that out there, too. Because we're, we have an, we all, most of us grew up with an analog childhood. And now we are in a, having a digital adulthood. So we are, we, we are adding on. Like, we, we grew up with, without these things, and we're adding them into our life, we're adding them into our performance, we're adding them into our work. So I think about how do we actually integrate technologies into our work? And, 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 and how do we, and perhaps that's co-creating with young people who, who are growing up with these technologies, like young people as co-creators, working with us and maybe the elephant in the room, which I wrote down during that conference, I've been carrying around this, this book, but maybe the elephant in the room is, um, is the elephant in the room that theater needs to innovate and digitize or it will just die? You know, is that why all of this talk? Like, are we worried that if we don't, then young people are just not gonna be interested? You know, so, so those are some things I was thinking about. Anyways, um, I want to show you, is that my time? Yeah. Oh. I mean, you can have a, you can talk about the picture. I'm oh, sorry. I, I really was like, I have nothing to say. I have nothing prepared. <laughs> oh my God, all morning. I'm like, Ooh. but can I, I'll tell you this really quickly because this is um, out of that digital conference. I mean, if you know me, you know that I work by writing lots of things down on big pieces of paper and then I write them again on big pieces of paper. And so we were doing this at the conference. It's very analog. And this is one of, the, one of the things that came forward. So I'll just share it with you um, because, anyway, this is something that the TYA sector in Canada is working on. It's called Digibox, conceptual Digibox. Uh, it, it is really messy, uh, but I'm, I just came from that conference. And um, <coughs> how it works is this, the first step is we're, if we were to, I'm just gonna pretend we're doing it. So we go and research and consult with experts and technologies and companies and like people like you that are doing all this mind-blowing stuff and figure out what's going on and then figure out what we want to do, what we want to experiment with. And then we create these kind of like digi boxes and it could be a concept. It could also be like a binaural sound system and a VR headset or it could be like a digital converse, like a plan or a concept. But we, we kind of package those up, and then those lines are all different. They, go to different. they each go to different companies in TYA, because we're trying to figure out a way that we can play with the digital stuff with young people. And, and so just thinking about it, then investing a whole bunch of money, and it doesn't work, and they don't like it. So then, um, and then so each time it goes there, we would, uh, the pilot would be to take a digital media expert a youth in the community as co-creators, a youth collaborative designer that would c kind of take the, like, like work in collaboration with the digital media expert to um, gather the expertise and then other artists and technicians. And maybe three to five days, some people were saying, I was saying like two weeks, you know, but to play with that, that tool or those, that equipment and then to share what they learned um, online could be like templated. So that's like kind of another like sharing. And then it will go to the next company and you could sign up for the next box. And I'll, I'll wrap it up here, but just to say that I also, that's why it says showcase sharing, because I was with a colleague I was working with wanted to keep it really small and I wanted to like blow it up so massive. But I was thinking also, this is a way that we can like play with some of these tools, see how it integrates in our work, see how it integrates with um, young people and then co-create work in that kind of more organic way with young people and see what they they discover and I would like to see also like the youth collaborator designer who works with the tool in this company then move along with the box to the next company to share actually in real time and experiment with what they did with the company before share that those expertise as they develop a new thing and perhaps even create a piece that it's like that, that we use one technology and you know, as it goes across the country, 
one scene is created and then another and then another and then another until we kind of create like this digital train of thought based on different like um, tools and what we can do with them. So this is kind of where we're at in Theater Free and Heights. Thanks so much for listening. It's amazing to be here. I'll say, yeah, my last thing, my question is, can we build community around each other through technology? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, last but certainly not least, um, yeah. we have Kate Bergstrom. <laughs> Kate Bergstrom is a director and artist in the band Hot Club. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Hot Club, based in New York City, co-created with Todd Anderson, Alex Dupuis, and Martin Galvao. Hot Galvo. Club Galvo, thank you. Hot Club's work has been seen at Ars Nova, Red Cat, and more. In this excerpt from their piece Fish and Seafood, created in residency at Baby Castle's Gallery in May, Valerie, her character, and Alexa Google home amalgamation is introduced to her oh, to her homeowner, a millennial marine biologist named Mar Martine, and begins her work. Great. Hi, thanks for for uh, having me and us via me from Hot Club. I was very excited to um, hear some of the conversations yesterday we were having about uh, different ways digital technology intersects with uh, the body. And um, also wanted to talk today about our own um, team's radical excavation of self-commodification. Uh, because we have so many different levels of technology that we're speaking in, I'd like to focus today on our most recent residency and our work around this one character, the Google Home Alexa amalgamation known as Valerie. Um, what you're gonna see are some really DIY tech, uh, tech aesthetics. This is a, a, a moment where we as Hot Club in our, um, in our gallery sort of, uh, residency, locked ourselves in a basement for four days, spent all of our per diem money on uh, goods from Party City to turn it into a miniature celebration and um, uncover different, uh, different things that as millennials uh, we are considering in ourselves um, becoming and, uh, and uh, thinking about our own uh, branding. Um, so, if you want to go to the next page, I'll show you, this is a small excerpt from our piece, Hot Box from Ars Nova, or it's sort of a trailer, um, <coughs> so that you can see some of the aesthetics we're working in, and then I'll share a little bit further some of the rehearsal videos and how our piece is evolving into this, this piece, Fish and Seafood. Martin Galvo, age 25 to 34, gender male, on top of the news and on top of the trends. <laughs> and yet you feel a bit lonely, don't you, Martin? The rest of the world can't keep up with your rugged individuality. <laughs> yes, Martin, it's time for you to meet your new digital assistant. You need shoulder the burden of changing the world on your own. Valerie, your new digital assistant, and you are? 
Martin? I heard Martin. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Martin, let's get started. I will need to log into your Wi-Fi with your password every time I get started. Or you can connect me to your password manager and I can handle it from there. <laughs> connect to password manager. Okay, great. Nice. Nice. <laughs> <Dark. laughs> Um, so that was from our, uh, our piece, Hotbox, and uh, in this residency where we, uh, we decided to lock ourselves in a basement, thanks to Party City Festuni, uh, we have tried to take our sort of aesthetic of vaporwave culture jamming, uh, the somatic experience of, of online shopping, the tech aesthetic and um, concepts of determined <coughs> ah, for, for millennials and turn it, into, um, turn it into a deeper excavation of our own uh, gender politics within the group, um, uh, the idea of toxic masculinity, environmentalism, third culture kids, and, uh, and then a different percussive sort of experimentation that Martin was doing with his drum kit. This ended up translating to thinking about fishing, fish, TMZ, and Johnny Depp. <laughs> uh, lock yourself in a basement, anything can happen. Uh, and, and so as some of you know, Johnny Depp is sort of a, a textbook a, a celebrity environmentalist. He also has had recently problems um, in the exposure of his own uh, it, relationships to his, the women in his life, and um, he is, in a couple of my male friends' mind, a, an idyllic man. So, uh, moving into our next, into our next uh, sort of videos. Uh, it, we, this we've started playing with how we're continuing to use Chrome extensions to um, sort of jam and make Chrome extensions and the creation of instrumentation um, uh, on tech. It intersect with um, intersect with analog instruments like synths from like the 90s and 80s or, or keyboards like Casio keyboards and um, and different percussive instruments that are that are being used uh, on both Valerie's body and Martine's body. But here's how how uh, a moment of of Todd and Martine jamming into the Valerie, um, hoping that it sort of reflects a, a kind of sort of like Coachella -y mini like concert vibe. <laughs> Uh, so we're experimenting with vibes here. Uh, <laughs> let's see what let's see what we got. by Alex Dupuy, we just have a shame. So if you go to the next video, so we're starting to play with turning that into a more full song. And then what you saw in the other video was uh, uh, a moment where uh, I, uh, we had a YouTube video live streaming Alex playing guitar in Europe, where he was on a European tour band, but he was actually in Europe for a conference. So we had this famous guitarist in Europe live streaming in for the, for the show. Um, but now we're trying to experiment with how we can make it a live song and explore the intersection between death metal and, um, and uh, anti-female sentiments um, uh, and unboxing videos. So here we go. <laughs> <laughs> I 
so we can't hear there, but we've explored, we've got a couple singers who are working with us to, to find that sort of like the, the uh, vocalization of like, give me the package uh, in, in that moment. Um, and what we're doing is the singers, uh, one of them, Kristen Hader, is a, is a uh, sort of death metal explorer, um, but it's all female voices that have been um, uh, vocoded down into other registers in that section. And you'll see a little bit of that here. This is a song, I'm really putting myself out here. This is a song that we're developing called For Men About Products for Men. Um, and uh, it is also being told by, right now, the Valerie character. And we're figuring out how we're going to keep moving that forward, um, exploring the intersection between Valerie as an entity, which is neither male nor female, um, but a, like a, a, an amalgamation of uh, heteronormative patriarchal gender tropes and um, a character embodied on stage. So Valerie in this section has learned, as explained, to play the Casio piano. And is, uh, Martim has just left his uh, dissertation about fish and seafood um, to go by, uh, by uh, um, uh, at Tony's Pizzeria for Men, a, um, a uh, double XL like protein pack sandwich. So this is, there'll be some screw ups, but this is, this is part of the song. Martim Yango. Age 25 to 34, gender male, president of New York City now. Oh, more teams interest include Muzak, fitness, pizza, skateboard, Arizona ice tea, Mercedes, Benz, Adidas, and Facebook. But mostly, our team is interested in products for men. What is men? <laughs> this is a wiki page about men that Google Chrome extensions have turned into a page about Martine. <laughs> No. 
Because it's not it's by George Foreman Griddle that you stand up. It's by George Foreman making up and I just make it all. No, no. It's actually my phone that's making it. It isn't. It's a grill. Oh, the girl down, guys. You are all right. It's my G5 with five removable cookies. So it makes all of your baby food. And it knocks off the bed. <laughs> Great, I'm out of time, but uh, this, thank you for watching. This is a, one of our uh, pieces in, in progress, um, and ideally we wouldn't be uh, uh, projecting it on a back wall, but um, uh, hoping to continue to excavate uh, uh, using like Chrome extensions and web browsing, character, and self-commodification. If anyone has any thoughts, questions, please yeah. talk to me about mm -hmm. feedback, and um, yeah, hopefully you come see one of our shows. <laughs> Okay, awesome. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing it. It's actually really great to understand more about what everyone's doing. And for those of you who are here for the whole festival, also looking forward to the Canada-U.S. Uh, Exchange Part 2 on Friday in Gananoque at the Thousand Islands Playhouse. We'll continue this work. Uh, to festival notes.